everyone, everyone, Whitnick and Rachel. If you're new here and haven't been following our adventures over the past year, you'll typically find us vlogging our travels around the world. But today's video is going to be a little bit different. As we've traveled through different countries, we've noticed that some things are a little bit different than what we're accustomed to in Canada and the UK. The reason that we have this channel is not just to share our experiences of travel, but also to hopefully inspire you to do the same. With that, then in each of the countries that we are going to, we are going to be rolling out some handy tips and tricks so that if you are interested in going to the same places that we have, then you're armed with some very useful information. Today's video is going to focus on traveling around Indonesia, but specifically in and around Bali. If you've been watching our videos, you'll know that we went to Uluwatu, Nusa Penida, the Gili Islands, Ubud, and Canggu while we were there. While a few of the pointers we're going to talk about today are specific to each of those places, some are going to be more targeted at the country as a whole. We hope that you find these useful. The main airport that serves the island of Bali is in Denpasar. And so Denpasar Airport is also known as Bali International Airport. The terminal building is very well equipped with all manner of different shops and restaurants that you can take full advantage of if you wish to. However, it is worth noting that if you get in late enough, a number of these different amenities are going to be closed. So food options, if you fly in a bit late, are going to be a bit thin on the ground. We made the mistake of buying some food from the WH Smith, which was still in the terminal. What we didn't realize is that when you come out of the terminal building and go just across the road, there is a Circle K right there where it has a bunch of snacks and foodstuffs that are about half the price. Therefore, if you're flying in to Bali a bit late and you're in need of some food to keep you tiding over, then that's where we recommend going before you then get your onward travel. Speaking of things that are cheaper outside of the airport, SIM cards are also cheaper outside of the airport. However, this comes with a little bit of a caveat. Registering that SIM card if you are outside of the airport, so elsewhere on the island, is a little bit tricky. So in the end, it may actually be easier to get yourself an eSIM. We have been using Aerolo all throughout our year of traveling abroad and it's worked really well but there are multiple different eSIMs available and that way you don't have to worry about having a problem with registering if you decide to get a SIM card outside the airport nor do you have to pay more money by getting a SIM card at the airport. Bali is an amazing place but one thing it does fall a little bit short on is public transport. There are next to zero options as far as that goes because the infrastructure is just not in place. So therefore instead you have the option to either rent a vehicle, generally speaking the best way to do that is renting bikes, or the alternative is arranging transfers and taxis with your accommodation as well as a couple of ride sharing apps. In other videos, we have mentioned Grab as being the main app of choice, which is a wonderful option for multiple different types of vehicle. However, there is another one which I believe is specific more to Bali than anywhere else, and that is called Gojek. With Gojek, then really that is aimed more at getting on the back of a licensed rider's bike and being taken back to your destination. While that was a bit of a dicey proposition for us as a couple, if you're a solo traveler and you're looking to save a bit of money, then perhaps Gojek would be the right way forward. For everything else though, Grab is good on the main island of Bali. However, with the likes of the Noosa Islands, then ride shares are not available, so you would need to sort out your transfers via your accommodation, or if you're planning on doing an organized tour, then through your tour operator. If you're planning on going to Gili though, then that has zero motorized vehicles of any kind. Really, the way to get around is by a push bike, or alternatively, on a horse-drawn carriage, if you feel like paying a little bit extra for a fancy experience or if you need your luggage transported. As previously mentioned, one of the main ways to get around pretty much most of Indonesia, not just Bali, 
is on a motorbike. And generally speaking, rentals for scooters are available practically everywhere that you go, including in most instances your accommodation as well. The ideal rental price should be about 70,000 rupiah a day, which equates to about $6.50 Canadian per day. For foreign drivers, you are going to need to have an international driver's permit on your person at all times. The reason for this is that if you are stopped and you don't have that on you, then you could be subject to a fine. So to avoid an unpleasant experience, it is always worth just making sure that you have your IDP on you anytime you come in contact with a vehicle that you're driving yourself. Even if the rental place does not ask to see the documents, the police almost definitely will. So definitely worth avoiding unnecessarily unpleasant experiences. The condition of the road surfaces in Bali vary quite a bit. In Uluwatu and Ubud and Chenggu, the conditions of the road are actually really, really good. However, when you go to the smaller islands, like the Nusa Islands, then the road conditions deteriorate a little bit. The topography of the island is very hilly, so you are faced with steep climbs and steep descents. And to top that all off, there is a lot of loose gravel and potholes, so if you're an inexperienced bike rider or scooter rider, it's probably just not worth it to rent a bike and risk crashing it, or worse, injuring yourself. We saw so many people who had bandages on their face, their elbows, their knees, road rashes. So just something to be aware of. Do not overestimate your own skill on the smaller islands. And for God's sake, get a helmet. It is so important. We cannot stress this enough. As we mentioned earlier in the video, public transport is very limited in Bali. However, in order to get between the islands, we are happy to say that you can do this by ferry. And the best way to book this is a website that we mentioned before in other videos. It's called EasyBook. It is your best friend and it makes planning your travels between the islands very easy. While in a lot of places that we've been to, the tap water has been usable in some way, shape or form, this is not the case in Indonesia. If you are looking to either brush your teeth or wash anything that you're planning on eating or drinking or anything like that, then always use bottled water. As with any country that does have these kinds of problems, then the water is very cheap to buy, so there's no concerns there, but just make sure that it does come from a bottle. The good news is though that your accommodation more often than not may actually have a water cooler available for you so you may not have to worry about it so much but certainly when you're on the go bottled water is the way forward one of the best things to do in and around bali is to go on a boat tour that includes snorkeling and or diving there is incredible wildlife or marine life to see in this area and it's something that should not be missed it's definitely a highlight and probably one of the more popular tourist attractions. The trips that are advertised online are generally the same ones as the ones being advertised at various different local shops or by people who are advertising them while walking the beach. There are obviously price discrepancies from what you'll see online in the local shops and from the individuals trying to sell them on the beach. However, they actually all go from the same location and generally include the same things, whether that be the snorkeling and diving equipment or lunch. So when you're looking to book these day trips, it's best to shop around to try and get the best price. We generally paid around 200,000 rupiah per person. And as I mentioned, it would include snorkeling equipment as well as lunch for the day. But I did notice that the price generally jumped if I was attempting to book online, which is why I never did it, because you're having to pay a third party. The other option is that if you're in a really incredible area, and in this case, I'm referring to the Gili Islands, you can actually just snorkel right off of the beach, which means that you don't need to take a boat tour to get to the best snorkeling and diving locations. And in this particular instance, you can just rent snorkeling or diving equipment from one of the local shops instead of having to book a full tour. 
I mean, why would you spend so much money to go on a full tour when you could just snorkel off the beach and see the same incredible marine life like turtles and spend less money? Let's talk a little bit about restaurants in Bali. You will find anything from restaurants selling very Western foods that are targeted for tourists to warrens which sell local and traditional food. Now the more Western restaurants are definitely pricier, whereas if you want something affordable and cheap but yet delicious, warungs are the way forward. The menus that you'll find at the Western restaurants are not one and the same. The price you see on some of them is the total price, whereas others do not include taxes and services in the displayed price on the menu. However, there will be a note at the bottom of the menu informing you that taxes and services are not included. The other thing to note is that if you want a non-dairy option, it is going to be more expensive because there is an additional fee for a non-dairy milk. Outside of the restaurants and the warungs, then obviously you still need to fend for yourself on the food front. If you're planning on self-catering, then it is worth noting that a lot of places that seem to be a convenience store or list themselves as a supermarket do not really have the same types of goods that you would expect in a supermarket in North America or Europe. And they predominantly would only have drinks and dried goods. There's only a couple of places in Bali, and I think the main ones that we could think of were Ubud and Changu, where you actually get a more Western style supermarket option available to you. With those, the pricing is actually still just as good as the rest of Bali, we're very happy to say. So if you do find one, then that is still very much an affordable option for you. Beyond that though, especially when it comes to getting fresh produce and such like, then definitely going to the local market is the right way forward. You can get some phenomenal homegrown ripe fruit, which is in season for barely anything, and it will be some of the most delicious stuff you'll ever try. A number of tourist facing retailers in Bali will actually take card, Apple Pay and Google Wallet, but a lot of the time they'll charge an extra service fee, which is usually about two to 3%. However, market stalls, warungs and parking lots usually only take cash. So you always need to have some on you. Alongside snorkeling and some of the most stunning landscape you're ever going to see, another reason to come to Bali is to enjoy the beaches. If you just want to lay a towel out on the beach, then generally speaking, there's absolutely zero problem with that whatsoever. No one's going to have a problem with you doing that. But if you're looking for something a little bit more comfortable, like a sun lounger or a bean bag or something like that, then typically speaking, these are going to be owned by bars and restaurants that are dotted along the beach. In order for you to use them, then you can expect it to be charged by those places for the usage. In some cases, they can be a flat rate fee, but a number of them will just say, please buy something from us, be it a drink or some food or both, and then you'll get the usage of that lounger until you leave. However, obviously, it's always a good idea to ask before you make use of any such facilities. Another thing to bear in mind, and this is especially important for those who are planning on using bikes around the islands, then you will be charged for parking. It will be a nominal fee, generally speaking, no more than about 15,000 rupiah, so just over a dollar. But this is another reason why it's important to have cash on you at all times. One thing that we've noticed as a bit of a theme in most of the countries that we've gone to is that places of worship are free. Technically, this is also the case in Indonesia. However, in order to still get some money in for visitors, then rather than calling it an entrance fee to get into specific temples, they refer to it as a donation. So with that, if you're planning on going to some of the more famous temples around the island, then do be expected to pay a donation in order to get into the temple site. There will be an expectation on dress code, and for that, they may expect you to also rent a sarong. So if you are planning on going to such a site, 
just make sure that you do your research to look out for any potential additional costs that you weren't expecting. And that's our list for Indonesia. We hope that you found our tips and tricks helpful and that you can apply them to any of your future travels. That being said, we know that this is not a complete list, so if you have any questions or further suggestions, please leave a comment below. Until next time though, take care. And keep smiling.